Hey guys, this is your host Gooby, and welcome to the Toon Balloon Podcast, our outlet to discuss, theorize, and enjoy our favorite webtoons with the occasional anime and manga sprinkled in between. All right, guys, so this is the moment we have all been waiting for, an epic discussion into the chaotic series, Everything is Fine, by Mike Birchall. It recently updated with its season one finale, and I could not be more confused, intrigued, and excited for the next installment of a series. I knew I needed to discuss what the heck just happened, and if you have not yet please consider checking out my last two episodes going in depth into this series, as I will be touching on some of the things I have mentioned in those discussions. This week's episode will touch on my analysis of chapters 20 through 29, as well as my theories of what it is to come. If you love Mike Birchall's work, then please consider checking out his Patreon. He shares exclusive content, such as the behind the scenes of making the series discounts for everything is fine merch, and by the looks of it, sneak peeks into his new upcoming book, Witch. So if you need more creepy content after that insane season finale, then I highly, highly recommend that you go and check that out. All links to his social media and methods of support will be in the description box below. Before we jump into the discussion, I will offer a brief summary of what has happened so far, and then we'll chat. There will be spoilers, so you have been warned. Now, let's talk Everything is Fine by Mike Birchall. Previously on Everything is Fine, Bob is seen on the phone with the authorities as his red eye has activated. By the sounds of it, Bob is dismissed by the person on the other side of the line and Bob is unable to make a report. As this is taking place, Maggie returns to the basement to speak with Sam. Things seem to be going swimmingly for them but Maggie begins to voice her remorse for ratting out their neighbors for a murder they didn't commit. We are shown through a flashback that Sam planted the evidence in Bob's basement and is shown falling over the fence when he escaped, hence explaining what that thud sound was from the last chapter. Maggie managed to gain immunity from any future red eye tips by using Tom's phone and telling a colleague of his that they are innocent. Maggie and Sam console one another over the difficult position they are in. And we then transition over to what Bob and Linda are doing. It's revealed that Linda herself has access to her own Faraday cage in the form of an aluminum closet. The couple argue, and although it seems that Bob suspects Sam of impersonating an officer, Linda shuts down his theory. They then plot to leave for Lakeview in the morning. Nighttime arrives. Sam and Maggie share a cup of joe, discuss the events that transpired, and affirm that they love each other. Then it was time to move the body. The couple sneak into Linda's home to plant the body with the rest of the evidence. As they attempt to escape, Linda turns on the light in another room. Without any other options, Maggie and Sam break a window to escape, leaving Linda suspicious. Just before she is about to report the incident, an officer shows up at her doorstep. While this is happening, another officer is confronting Maggie and Sam in their own home. He then scopes their home to find that nothing is out of the ordinary. Bob and Linda, on the other hand, are not doing so hot. Bob fumbles his words, and it didn't help that they had a bloody hammer on their table. 
the officer investigates their home to find Tom's body. The two are then put on red status. Maggie and Sam witness this happening. We are shown images of Bob and Linda's children jumping off a building through the perspective of their red eyes. Maggie and Sam leave their home and pack their bags for Lakeview. As they are leaving the neighborhood, they see a literal fire truck torch a home. It's revealed that dozens of neighborhoods have been destroyed and their neighborhood was next. In episode 28, Judy is seen entering a box factory to find Charlie attempting to incinerate himself. Judy pushes him to safety and attempts to sacrifice herself for him to live. Charlie stops her and gives in to help her. She then welcomes him to the rebellion. In the season finale, Maggie and Sam arrive at Lakeview to be greeted by Julian, a new neighbor, and Laura, the mayor of Lakeview and the wife of Officer Tom. Sam, Maggie, and the officer all attempt to offer their condolences to Laura over her loss of her husband, Tom, but Laura brushes it off and she then reaffirms that everything is fine. Whew, okay, I tried my best to slim down that summary, but we had a lot to catch up on and there was a lot that happened in these recent chapters. So I'm going to touch on where we left off from my last discussion. So the unusual thud we heard at the end of chapter 19 was actually Sam falling over the fence. So I was right on one of my guesses there. <laughs> I am assuming those giant cat heads that they have to wear would make one's body feel like a bobblehead. So it made a lot of sense for Sam to lose his balance when he jumped over the fence. <laughs> so that panel really did make me chuckle. It was very good comedic timing. And also by the looks of it, the reason Bob was dismissed on his phone call was because the authorities were growing suspicious of him because Maggie was impersonating Tom through his phone. That was a good play on Maggie's part, considering she really had to think quickly and find a way to get out of this mess safely. The planting of the evidence was strategic and Sam was tasked with masking his voice, which if we remember that everyone's voices are altered in this world, thanks to the cat masks. So Sam had to watch old videos of Tom playing with his kids as a way to impersonate him. And I really don't know, how, I, I think Maggie explained that essentially he was supposed to play audio clips, but it seemed like when we saw the scenes of him asking for whiskey and saying that only him should go into the basement, I was still trying to understand how that method worked in order to mess with the mask. I guess those masks are just, they might have like a, a faulty quality to them to be able to mess with them that easily, but that did work in their favor. So that's good. So they were watching old videos of Tom with his kids and the two of them are scheming their way out of this mess, which alludes to the title of this chapter, working the angles, which essentially means to subject one to a scheme and quick question. So does being an officer in this world allow you to keep old info of your children? Officer Tom had videos stored in his phone of himself playing with his children. This is what I am assuming that the two of them were watching because it literally says um, that someone was addressing Officer Tom as daddy. So. I don't think this is the case for like regular citizens to be allowed to carry things that remind them of their children, since it seems like they kind of have to live in a way where they never existed. So I'm assuming this is like a privilege given to officers 
And by the looks of it later on, people from Lakeview, because Officer Tom is from Lakeview, and people seem to have more privileges than the other ones in these small neighborhoods over here. This was just something I noticed. I, I really don't know what to collect after this information. Like, I never have seen Maggie hold something that used to be her daughter's. It doesn't seem like they're allowed to have anything like to possess that used to be something from their child. So I feel like everyone is playing a game of chess with one another here. <laughs> it's like there is 1D, 2D, 3D chess, and then there's Maggie trying to play some 5D chess. And I am suspecting that she's going to meet people who are playing 7D chess and we're just gonna continue combating each other here because this is a very combative environment and everyone is shown to be just trying to survive in this climate. So Maggie is feeling a lot of remorse for the things that she has had to do for the sake of her daughter's life. And that's understandable. I don't think she ever thought of her ideal murder weapon to be a hammer, but here we are. And this world is so cruel, but the only way to make it in this world is to be just as ruthless. Maggie texts the commissioner chief to place a red eye ban on herself and Sam to gain immunity from any more tips in the future. I was a little worried that this would trip out her chances since the phrasing felt a little off. Most of the time, the officers only ever address it as red status, not exactly red eye status. So with her calling it red eye ban, I was naturally nervous because I feel like there is always so much specific focus in the series. And I thought, oh no, she's gonna get caught because she didn't say the right term for it. But no, things were fine. Thankfully, the commissioner chief fell for it, so it seems like the coast is clear. But at what cost? Maggie is struggling with the dilemma of attacking others for her own personal gain. I fully advocate for Maggie to completely own her neighbors because from the looks of it, Linda is a two-faced hypocritical snake who had it coming. But we'll touch on that in a bit. And thing is, everyone is in a similar boat in this neighborhood because they are all just trying to get their kids back. Sam exemplifies this at the end of chapter 20 by telling Maggie that she is a mom, that she's not doing anything wrong, that she's not a monster. And the power of a parent's love is so evident in this series. Maggie's only motivation is her child. Same for Sam, same for Bob, same for Charlie, and Linda as well. Everyone is tackling this battle differently, but they still have the same goal. Now in chapter 21, one more time, I actually enjoyed seeing the parallels of our two main contrasting couples. We see a loving dynamic between Maggie and Sam here, a couple that raises each other up, supports and comforts one another despite their circumstances. And despite what Maggie has done, Sam is still Maggie's rock and her big spoon. This is both so endearing to read and it's just so sweet. I know the relationship has suffered a lot from the government's involvement and everything. So I don't think the two of them have ever been able to connect like they used to. So no matter how hectic like things have been, they still have each other. And this whole experience did bring them closer together. Sam did pitch to Maggie that they should probably wrap a closet in foil rather than a basement. And I thought, oh, you know what? That's, that's pretty smart. I, even Maggie didn't think of that. And it seems like it would use less foil than using an entire basement to wrap. And to see that later, 
we are revealed that freaking Linda over here has an aluminum foil closet herself. Now, I said earlier that Linda was hypocritical. Well, here's why. This woman ratted out our boy Charlie to the authorities because he was out here sourcing foil to make a Faraday cage. And you know, in the end of the day, she's doing the exact same thing. Now, here's the thing. I'm not sure if she started doing this after Charlie got caught or she just knew what he was doing with all that foil because she was doing the same thing and decided, hey, if I rat this guy out because I know he's doing something bad, I'll get a reward out of it. Now, my second guess seems the most plausible with all of this since I would assume if she was doing the same thing as Charlie, she would have an easier time ensuring that he'll get in trouble. Regardless of that, this woman is clearly doing the same thing and proceeds to turn on him just to gain an advantage. And you know, maybe she was just trying to get her kids back like everyone else, but you know what she couldn't do? She couldn't let anyone else go. She didn't have to report Maggie since she was already in the clear to go to Lakeview. No, she was thirsty for power. She was thirsty for more control over people since she has no control in this environment of hers. And she wanted to get a taste of it again by ratting out more of her neighbors. I already didn't like Linda. And I think a lot of people can agree with me that we don't like Linda. <laughs> but I was able to understand why she did it in the first place, like in the first place. But after seeing this and the stunts that she continues to pull, completely had me rooting for whatever karma was coming for her next. Also, she is aware of the pings lasting 10 minutes each. I feel like understanding the foil concept, that's one thing, you know, like, oh, it blocks out the radio waves. But how did she figure out the pings? Where did she get this intel? We might know later in the discussion. Maybe, that's my theories later. So regardless, this chapter gives us some insight on what Linda and Bob's relationship look like. It's toxic. Linda is pretty apprehensive with Bob. She discourages him and essentially talks down to him. And the thing about Bob is that he's pretty chill. Yeah, he knew if we're going to rat out Charlie to prove loyalty to get our daughter back, I'll do it. You know, it's like, you know, he's trying to be supportive in a way. Um, but whenever uh, Linda wanted to rat out Maggie next, he was like, hey, we don't really need to do that. We already got Charlie. And she's like, nah, I'm going to go and rat him out. I knew she was crazy in the head. And then here is Bob just trying to be sensible about it. And it's like, I don't want to have to attack more people if I don't need to. So he seems a little bit more level headed about everything and not so vindictive. And so to see that um, Bob is here theorizing that Sam impersonated the officer and that the officer is dead due to Maggie and Sam, um, Linda kind of dismisses that theory quickly and essentially belittles him. And let me just say, did Bob have access to the leaks to the plot of this story or something? Because he configured such an accurate theory in seconds. It was terrifying. I was thinking, oh no, that was weirdly quick. And I cannot believe he figured it out so quick. Maggie and Sam are done, but no, Linda isn't having it. She calls him an idiot. She stomps down on Bob's deductions and Bob backs down on this theory he made. His confidence was shot due to Linda being so darn ugly towards him. So essentially, Linda ruined any chances they had to actually combat Maggie in this level of chess. So Linda decides they will leave for Lakeview in the morning which makes sense. If they did leave sooner, it would raise a lot of red flags, but they don't make it to the morning since the whole final ordeal happens that night. 
Maggie and Sam are sharing a cup of joe in the basement. And Sam mentions that he said caffeine and not coffee. So I'm guessing caffeine isn't allowed for them anymore. And why do you suppose that is? We've seen what they are allowed to eat in this world, which is essentially all canned food. Caffeine seems to be excluded from their list of approved items. I wonder if this is just another method of their government trying to control everyone. Maybe since caffeine brings people joy, they didn't want that to be offered because they like torturing people. Or do they only offer bland food as a method to maintain a sort of sameness in their world? You see, everyone eats the same thing, therefore everyone's health should be the same. And trying to ensure that their people are fit for the government standard. Caffeine is known to change brain chemicals, kind of like a stimulant. And this maybe is something they don't want their people consuming as it could affect whatever those cat masks are supposed to be doing. Or it could just affect the demeanor that they are trying to create for all of their citizens. Also, how were they going to drink the coffee? If you remember in a past episode, I think it was chapter six, friends for dinner, they have to affirm their loyalty to the government in order to eat. So they are in an aluminum foil room that kind of just deflects radio waves. So was the coffee just for aesthetic purposes? Did they not drink it? I don't know. That's a whole mystery to me. Either way, we get to hear some cute reminiscing of their daughter, who happens to be um, a barista herself. And apparently she gave them wet mud at one point for them to drink (laughs) in the past. You know, kid things. By the sounds of it, the food they eat doesn't sound all that appealing if they thought mud wasn't so bad in comparison. Another weird thing about their lifestyle is the concept of time. If you look at the clocks, it's unusual. Maggie mentions the leave at 80 minutes and back by 90. This is something that is shown in the first chapter of the series. When we see the alarm clock snoozed, the time was 2.60. I'm not sure what this could entail, but it just alludes to the prominent changes their government has enforced that everyone has to deem as normal. Sam then asks Maggie why she couldn't confide in him over her plans. To be fair, this is a sticky question to answer. As readers, we all kind of suspected that Sam could have potentially betrayed Maggie if he found out her use of the foil. It's been years since they had a normal conversation and she wasn't sure if she could trust her husband with something so sinister and dangerous. For one, Maggie was fully aware of Sam trying to do the things the right way in hopes to get their daughter back. She knew that he got comfortable with that lifestyle. I can understand the fear of wanting to push past that boundary because he wasn't trying to rebel in the first place. He even apologizes to Maggie about the way he has treated her uh, those three years. I know everyone loves Maggie. I love Maggie too, but Sam definitely is a real one. He supports his wife. He recognizes he has done bad things and he's apologized for it. And he is just a loving and supportive partner to her despite the murder. Sam is definitely a favorite of mine in this series, and it's cute to see them so loving. So now it's time to move the body, which we will get into after this short musical interlude.
So Maggie and Sam are shown moving the body into Linda's basement. Things seem to be going well until Linda conveniently waltzes down into her kitchen. Chapter 23, One Body Problem, is such a thrilling chapter as it's all about atmosphere and less about the dialogue. It kept me at the edge of my seat because I just assumed that at some point Maggie and Sam were going to get caught. It did, however, give us a glimpse into Officer Tom's peers at the very beginning of the chapter. By the looks of it, his wife, Laura, is calling a colleague of Tom's, Greg. She mentions that he hasn't come home, which raises some flags, and it looks like Greg is about to investigate. Greg does mention to Laura that they do not have radios. I'm suspecting that they do not have radio systems at all because it would conflict with all of the radio waves that the government uses to control everyone with the masks on. So if you had a radio, that would really disrupt that whole frequency issue. So anyways, in chapter 24, Desperate Times, Maggie and Sam really do hit desperate times. And instead of quietly escaping the home, they instead smash a window with the bloody hammer. And by they, I mean Maggie, (laughs) in order to distract Linda and escape through the front window. It doesn't seem like the best plan, considering it could, you know have fingerprints and I thought this was going to be an actual problem but when the cops do finally show up none of this is taken into account in episode 25 they don't investigate further after seeing the initial crime scene they don't propose innocent until proven guilty and we certainly don't see a trial take place Instead, the police in this series decide if a character is guilty and then decide on their punishment. They weren't going to investigate further because they wanted to avenge their colleague. By the sounds of it, Greg and Tom were friends. So for Greg, someone had to pay. It just so happened to be the first couple who had the most visible leads on them. The cops here hold a lot of power over these characters and it's crazy to see how quickly characters are brought to the edge in this whole mess. Also, I still wonder if all cops on this series have certain mustaches. I feel like I would like to touch on a little more of this later when we talk about Lakeview, but it is really interesting to see the different variations of design for the other officers. So while Linda and Bob are getting interrogated, Maggie and Sam are getting their basement checked out by the other officer, but the coast is clear because they were able to remove all of the foil out of the basement. So things are good. As for Bob and Linda, on the other hand, well, Bob was trying to save face and he ended up just mentioning a murder that the officer didn't even question about in the first place. He just asked if they saw Officer Tom. So Bob made poor choices there. (laughs) Also, it does not help that the murder weapon is just present on that table in their home. So to top it all off as well, there is a whole dead body in their basement. The officer did not look happy and he proceeded to place the couple on red status. In chapter 26, Maggie and Sam watch as all of this unfolds before their eyes, which it just gets disastrous once Linda realizes that she was out of options. Sam said earlier in episode 24, P 
People are dangerous when they're out of options. And this is exactly what happens with Linda. She ran out of options and lunges at Maggie with a knife. Maggie is fine because one of the officers ends up tasing Linda. And right after that, they are put on red status. And this is when we are revealed with what exactly red status means. The people with the masks on are shown their children committing a forced suicide. Bob and Linda seem to have two children held captive by the government and they were forced to end their lives right before their eyes. So the theory of the red eye actually showing footage of their children was right. But here's something that I found strange from this chapter. Why were the kids conveniently on top of the building at that exact moment in time? I doubt the government is just keeping children at the top of buildings for any chance of a red status because if that was the case, then kids would all be standing on top of buildings because every opportunity is given to be give, be put on red status. Also, the narration. There was something off about that too. Everything felt way too instantaneous. And here are my speculations. One, this clip shown to the parents is actually old footage and the children are already dead. Why do I believe this is so? Because in chapter 25, it is titled in Japanese, which translates to, you are already dead. I assumed this title was just alluding to what was about to happen to Linda and Bob, that they'll be dead because there was no way out of this predicament that they are in. But, their children could have been dead from the very beginning and they gave their final words which is recorded for the footage and then the footage is used by the government to manipulate the citizens with it's so twisted to think that these people are living off a false hope and have put on a facade for so long to only never get back what they lost. Everyone in this series motivation is gone already. Now that's messed up to think about, but I also think this is a horror mystery genre and I try to not always think very negatively when it comes to the outcomes of some of these characters, but at the same time, I have to kind of think a little more cynical in order to find different ideas of what could possibly be happening in this series. So for my second speculation is that the children are not dead and the footage is a fluke. It could be staged or actually, it was just created for the sake of manipulating everybody. The government might actually be keeping the children alive for their own personal agenda that we aren't exactly aware of yet. I think either of these theories of mine could be possible. Um, I know the kids being alive could be a little far-fetched as I assume the government finds everyone disposable. So why go through so much effort to snatch everyone's children and force the parents to live a lie? I feel like this government is trying to create this supposed perfect society that can only be crafted with people who grow along with it. That means training, educating, and brainwashing the newer generations, which typically are the children at a very young age to become the perfect citizens that the government wants. I mean, when you listen to the dialogue of the children, they insinuate that they are lucky and that what they are doing is important. Either way, the footage felt way too instantaneous 
and convenient. And I feel like there is still something amiss. Another thing I noticed is that the information given for Bob and Linda is very strange. Either the couple's weight and age are combined, or it's designating that one of them is 83 and 395 pounds. You can see their stats through Greg's phone when he's about to put them on red status. I thought that was so peculiar because in no way does Linda seem like she's gonna be 83 and having two very young children. So I'm not really sure what's going on with that or if this society is trying to create its own new metric system and trying to be weird like America, <laughs> where America doesn't wanna fit in with everyone else using a different system. Anyways, it seems that there has to always be some person witnessing another person going into red status. It happened with Charlie and it happened with Bob and Linda. Maggie was always there for each of these situations and I feel like the cops kind of make them stay for it, you know? I mean, Officer Tom made Maggie stay and watch this happen. And with this, these two officers made Maggie and Charlie stay and watch this happen. I feel like this is a corrupted way to keep people in line and ensure that they stay loyal, but it also could potentially push people to rebel, like what it did to Maggie after she saw Charlie get put on red status. Now, in chapter 27, Heat Death, Maggie and Sam are given the opportunity to go to Lakeview. Maggie and Sam aren't too thrilled to leave their family home, but after the reveal at the end of this chapter, it really wasn't going to last. After using the power of Google, the term heat death is often referred to the heat death of the universe, which essentially details how the universe will expire now, I don't necessarily think this chapter is referencing the end of the universe, but it does allude to how the people in these neighborhoods just expired, literally dying from heat, fire, you know. <laughs> in chapter four, Mis Un Plus, Bob says that the smell is getting in after saying that the sunset looks nice. That smell was all of those houses and people getting set on fire down the street. In the final panels, we do see a literal fire truck using a flamethrower to torch down homes. It's a crazy image, but it's so sad to think that so many lives have been lost due to the government ultimately deciding that these people aren't useful anymore. It also doesn't seem like they care all that much as each neighborhood is torched down one after another. So my question is, was Linda aware of this? Did she know that neighborhoods were getting destroyed and this is why she pushed so hard to get rid of Charlie? Was the fella who ate Winston in chapter three actually a survivor from one of these burned down neighborhoods? What is the point of all of this though? Why burn all of these homes that seem to have been structured by the government themselves? What is the purpose of getting rid of all of these people that the government has worked so hard to control? My theory is that they really are scoping out for the people who are the most loyal to them. And the people who live in Lakeview seem to be of higher authority because they have proven their loyalty. This means that whoever doesn't make the cut, they get torched since they won't prove to be useful later. Maggie and Sam could have ultimately 
died if they had stayed and they could have never gotten their daughter back. They really were lucky in this situation. I mean, if you want to dig a little deeper, Lakeview happens to have water, which seems nicer than being near all that fire. And Lakeview is shown to be covered and surrounded by the woods. So it's more, um, more like a vacation area. I don't know how else to like describe that with its look and environment, it seems more inviting and quote unquote safer for them. Uh, Another theory of mine is just that the government just wants to eliminate the human race and is trying to make a new race because what the heck are they doing with these people's bodies and their heads with these cat masks? I mean, it just seems like the government is just a whole type of mess going on and whoever is leading all of this, why is everyone else listening to them? (laughs) I'm just curious to how this all even started. Like who thought, hey, I'm going to control everybody and put a mask on them. What what do you guys think? Because I doubt it's just one dude in charge of all of this. There's usually at least a little posse behind them, you know, kind of being their yes man. And at this point, I'm like, who would say yes to this? I have no idea. I have, (laughs) I have no clue on what could possibly be the reason to why all of this is, has even started and continued for so long. And we seem to have a running theme of fire, considering the next chapter, chapter 28, Pleasure to Burn, has Judy locating Charlie in a box factory and finds him trying to incinerate himself in the incinerator that I'm guessing he has had experience with since he said at that party that he was invited to with all of the other neighbors that he works at the box incinerator. So I was suspecting he was alive, but was just outcasted. And as it turns out, Charlie is pretty much in the same boat as the guy from chapter three, Mom Spaghetti, where he essentially has to carve out a hole in his mask in order to eat. Because I don't know if you remember if, I think I mentioned it in one of my last discussions, that in order for everyone to eat in this society, they have to affirm their loyalty. And that kind of gave us a hint that the government controls when a person is allowed to eat and essentially have their mouth open to, you know, enjoy food. And so we noticed that the other guy that was running around and trying to eat trash in Winston, that he had a ho- like a little hole carved out of his in his mask. So my assumption was that if you are red status, the government has completely shut you out from having any ability to sustain yourself. And it's essentially starving you from any chances of survival. So the only way to survive is to carve a hole out of your mask. And that is essentially what Charlie has been doing. He carved a hole. He's been eating a little bit in the box factory and somehow no one else has tracked them down in this area. But I guess it doesn't really matter because he's been outcasted and everyone is supposed to forget about him. So Judy, the woman who lent Maggie the aluminum foil at the grocery store and essentially was staring at Maggie in chapter two is here to help Charlie. Um, Charlie mentions how he came across a book in his car And I want to say that could be Science 101. And he mentions that he was throwing stuff out in the river. And that's when he came across of it when he got back in his car. I'm going to guess that whatever this stuff was that he was throwing out in the river was all of the things that were inside his home. So like furniture or other valuables. If you remember, the last glimpse we had of the inside of his home was that there was hardly anything in his house besides a lawn chair and a box. So Charlie must have found the book after, I'm assuming, Judy planted in his car. And so he decided he was going to create a Faraday cage. 
this didn't end well for Charlie. And now he is living as a homeless person in a box factory and has lost all hope and decided, hey, I'm just going to incinerate myself. So that's pretty rough for Charlie. And I mean, I like Charlie. He's pretty cool. Um, I feel like he is a fun character and I'm really disappointed that Linda had to go and rat him out because the dude was just chilling, enjoying his trains. And I guess he wanted to share this hobby. But you know what, Linda, you don't get to go and mess with his trains. We don't we don't play like that here. <laughs> and so Judy attempts to sacrifice herself for Charlie as a way to get him to trust her and he joins the rebellion. A few things I'd like to note is, did Linda have access to this book as well? I feel like there are a number of people aware of this book and maybe the rebellion tries to get the word out to as many people as possible. Is Judy the leader? Why is she so comfortable with talking about the rebellion and not worrying about the government listening in? She is either far more aware and elusive from government surveillance, or she is actually working for them. The rebellion could be a fluke for all we know, and Judy could be playing everybody. In the novel 1984, the person who was posing as a member of their rebellion in that series was actually just another spy for the government. Could this be the case for Judy as well? What do you guys think? I would like to know. If the rebellion is real, however, who else is there that is in it? Is the government aware of the rebellion as well? Chapter 29 is titled, All Good Things. Most of the time when I hear that phrase, I think of all good things come to an end. I'm thinking that'll be the case with Lakeview. And you're probably thinking, well, nothing was inherently good about the other place they were living. And you're right, it was awful, but I don't think this place will be any better than where they were before. We will be encountering high level figures like Mayor Laura, who seems to already be suspicious of Maggie and Sam. And then they will be encountering police officers since all of them seem well acquainted with one another and Now we are seeing strange phenomenons like the image of a sewn up squirrel eating, um, I think it's a finger. (laughs) I'm not sure, but I know squirrels don't eat meat. So that was an image and it's carved in my brain. (laughs) Why was the squirrel sewn up? I got nothing. I'm truly baffled here. Like, I don't know why it was just wandering around eating a finger. I'm thinking it's a finger. Um, If you guys got any ideas, please let me know because I am bamboozled here. Um, Anyways, (laughs) as for the new guy, Julian, he seems chill right now, but we'll have to keep an eye out because, you know, Everyone seems to be, you know, pretty okay until like they're not. And, you know, Julian seems like he could be a nice guy, but he could easily be very two-faced and that could be very terrifying (laughs) considering I think Lakeview is just full, full of piranhas. I'm going to say it like that. I'm thinking Lakeview is just a a battleground and it's going to be really difficult on Maggie and Sam. Also, do people from Lakeview have an opportunity to customize their masks? We see all the cops have different mustaches and then the mayor is tatted up with her heart on her eye. Julian has a butterfly on his mask. And also we have a woman in charge in Lakeview, which is very different from the traditional household lifestyle that Sam and Maggie were dealing with 
in their previous home. Maybe this place offers smaller freedoms, but still hangs on to everyone by keeping their children hostage. So no one is ever really free, so to speak. All I know is Lakeview is going to be one heck of a chess game. And I hope Sam and Maggie brought in the big guns because they are going to need it. Still, for the time being, those two will still have to pretend that everything is fine. Hey guys, so I'm hoping that you were able to enjoy my bit of a big deep dive theory discussion episode all about everything is fine. Um, I'll, I'll, geez, how long I've been talking? I've been about like an hour? Oh gosh. So if you have been able to listen to me for a whole gosh darn hour, then I highly commend you for being able to listen to me ramble on about <laughs> this series. Um, I have had a blast talking about this series. I love Everything is Fine. Um, I am so thankful for Mike Birchall for creating this because I absolutely love reading this series and I am so pumped for season two. I don't know when that's going to come, but when it does, you better believe I'll be hopping on that train. You get it? And just discuss and theorize and just get even more confused and creeped out um yeah talking about everything is fine is pretty fitting for october considering you know halloween and spooky season so i definitely was going to discuss everything is fine this month but it just so happened that the season finale was kicking in and i was like oh well that's convenient i guess we'll just make it a big episode then <laughs> so if you happen to have any theories or thoughts or whatever definitely listen in to my little snippet i add at the very end of the episode to kind of figure out ways to reach out to me and fill me in on what you think of everything is fine season one finale yeah so thanks guys i'll see you later Let me know your thoughts and opinions of what we discussed today in this episode by messaging me through either of my social media handles. Both my Twitter and Instagram handles are at the Toon Balloon. I would love to hear from you. Also, definitely tell me any other webtoons, anime, or manga you are interested in, and I may talk about them in future episodes. The Toon Balloon podcast can be listened to on SoundCloud, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcast, YouTube, and more. Now, let's end this episode of the podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today and taking the time to listen to my humble podcast. I look forward to talking with you again. This is the Toon Balloon Podcast. I was your host, Gooby. See you next time.